Uh, welcome uh, everyone today to this uh, webinar and again this is uh, AIOS masterclass and one of the unique webinars uh, for our residents and sorry uh, this is uh, AIOS masterclass what is possible after ophthalmology residency uh, by none other than uh, Dr. Gulapalli and Rao who's the founder okay. chair of LV Prasad Eye Institute. I think uh, he doesn't like very long introductions, but uh, uh, still I would like to introduce him. It's a privilege and honor for me to introduce uh, Dr. G. N. Rao, whom for the first time I saw as a postgraduate student in World Congress Cornea, the only Indian who was uh, presenting that uh, way back in 1990s. After a successful career in US as an academic ophthalmologist in 1987, Dr. Rao established LV Prasad Eye Institute in Hyderabad 31 years ago and is the founder and chair of that institute. He received his basic medical education in Guntur, Andhra Pradesh and completed his postgraduate residency at RP Center for Ophthalmic Sciences, All India Institute of Medical Sciences, New Delhi. He trained in US at the Tuft University School of Medicine in Boston and later at School of Medicine University of Rochester, where he continued on the faculty until 1986. He's one of the very few who, who returned back to his uh, country after, uh, after staying abroad uh, to establish L.V. Prasad uh, Institute at Hyderabad. His academic and research achievements uh, uh, surpass everybody else's, but just to name a few, uh, he has honorary doctorates from University of Melbourne and University of New South Wales, Australia, Dr. NTR University of Health Sciences India, University of Bradford, UK, and GITM University India. He's, he is the president of Academia Ophthalmologica International and this group of 80 of the most eminent academicians in ophthalmology in the world. He's visiting professor to many universities in US, Europe, Australia, and Asia. He's published several, th more than 300 papers in the peer-reviewed international journals and is on the editorial board of several international journals of ophthalmology. He is the fellow course surgeon of the Royal College of Physicians uh, and Surgeons Glasgow, fellow of the two of the Science Academies of India and fellow of National Academy of uh, Medical Sciences. He's been the former secretary general and later chair of the board and CEO of the International Agency for Prevention of Blindness in which he played a pivotal role in developing and fostering global initiative to eliminate avoidable blindness along with the WHO Vision 2020, the right to sight in partnership with WHO. He's been on the board of trustees for International Council of Ophthalmology and at leadership positions in many national and international eye care organizations. There are several other awards and honors to his credit, which include the Newman Award from ICO for Outstanding Global Leadership in Eye Care, Bernardo Streep Gold Medal from Academia Ophthalmologica Internationalis for contribution made to advancement of ophthalmology, Kufer Award from Arvo for outstanding accomplishments as a researcher, ophthalmologist, and humanitarian, Joe's uh, Rizal Medal from APO for outstanding contributions to eye care in the Asia Pacific region, World Cornea Congress Medal from International Cornea Society, amongst the first 10 for outstanding contribution to field of cornea. International Blindness Prevention Award from American Academy of Ophthalmology, Prasad Award by the Lighthouse International New York, Outstanding Humanitarian Services Award from American Academy of Ophthalmology, Arvo Alcon Keynote Lecture and Barry Jones Lecture of the Royal College of Ophthalmologists, UK. He, uh, he has received three awards from the AIOS and the Asia Pacific Academy of Ophthalmology and also the first Association of Eye Banks of Asia Award at the Asia Cornea Society Scientific Meeting of Asia Cornea Foundation. He was inducted into Ophthalmology Hall of Fame at the meeting of American Society of Cataract and Refractive Surgery in Los Angeles, Los Angeles which is a very rare fate for uh, anybody from India to achieve. He was inducted as Commander Order of the Star of Africa for distinguished services to Republic of Li Liberia and to Africa in public service. And, uh, and sciences by the president of Republic of Liberia. And also uh, he's the lifetime achievement uh, awardee by the All India Ophthalmological Society. So welcome uh, Dr. Rao to this uh, webinar and uh, we uh, hope to have uh, a great lecture and uh, deliberations and interactions uh, with our other uh, uh, panelists and moderators, uh, Professor Mahipal Sachdev, 
uh, needs no introduction. He's the uh, uh, founder and again, the director of the Center for Site Group of Hospitals and president of the All India Ophthalmological Society. I have with me Professor Rajesh Sena, who's the honorary treasurer of All India Ophthalmological Society and professor at RP Center Ames. Uh, Dr. Digvijay Singh, Director, Noble Eye Care, Gurgaon, uh, uh, Head, and uh, he's also heading the Narayana Super Speciality Hospital, and he's the President of Young Ophthalmology Society of India. Dr. Divakant uh, Mishra, who is uh, uh, working as a retina consultant at the IQ Group of Hospitals, Lucknow, and is the Secretary of the uh, uh, All India, uh, uh, is the Secretary of the Young Ophthalmology Society of India. And Dr. Sonal Kalia, who is the assistant professor at SMS Medical College, Jaipur, and is the vice president of the Young Ophthalmological Society. Apart from this, we have residents and fellows in ophthalmology uh, spanning across all the institutes, uh, which include uh, the uh, RP Center Ames, PGI Chandigarh, LV Prasad Eye Institute, Arvind Eye Hospital, Shankar Netrale, regional institutes of ophthalmology, center for sight, etc. So, uh, Without uh, now, uh, I think we would uh, begin the uh, talk. And before that, I would request uh, Dr. Mahipal Sachdev to say a few words uh, before we finally begin the uh, webinar or the talk. Uh, good morning, Dr. Nagrao. It's a pleasure to have you here in the master class. It's always uh, good to uh, hear the life story, the history, and uh, pearls of wisdom from people as accomplished and uh, as, uh, uh, as I would say, meritorious as you are. Uh, and uh, thank you very much. I think it's always an age uh, when the youngsters have an impressionable age that uh, if uh, guided properly, I think the mentorship and the guidance to youngsters is very, very important to shape and build the career. Uh, Namrata and uh, Rajesh are again uh, people who are uh, very, very actively involved in uh, All India Ophthalmological Society. And uh, I think they are uh, also helping and promote the thought building leadership development uh, with the young ophthalmologists of India. Uh, we will have a very secure and a sound uh, 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 ophthalmology society or ophthalmologists in India over the coming years as we groom the youngsters and uh, I think the youngsters are doing a fantastic job nowadays and they are really uh, second to none. Uh, the quest for learning the digital world has made it much easier for them to access uh, teaching material uh, and to maybe even see videos but one-to-one uh, -one interaction with legends uh, in ophthalmology like uh, Dr. Rao is really something which is uh, not uh, easily available uh, where you can have the thoughts and maybe ask him uh, questions and uh, clarify your doubts. Uh, Dr. Nagrao obviously is very very accomplished he is from uh, uh, he did his post graduation from the same alma mater as uh, ourselves uh, that is RP Center Ames. And I still remember my first meeting with Dr. Nagrao was in the uh, washroom of uh, Taj, Taj Mahal Hotel. And uh, that is the time uh, I think he had come for the uh, uh, Asia Pacific uh, Academy of Ophthalmology meeting. And I had presented my paper on corneal graft rejection. And uh, uh, he was listening, obviously, as a cornea person. And uh, we were uh, together in the washroom and he said, uh, young man, uh, what you showed there, you should ask your thesis guide. It's not actually epithelial graft rejection, but it is an epithelial defect. So just see as to what it is. So I don't know whether he remembers or not, but I still remember that was my first meeting. And I said, I don't know this man and he's uh, pulling me up on something. So then I went back and looked at it and uh, lo and behold, maybe he was right that it was an epithelial defect. But uh, to me, it had started earlier as a rejection and went on to an epithelial defect. The second meeting was he pulled, uh, he called me to a side in one conference or something and he offered me a job at LVP. Not upfront, but uh, in a subtle way, would you want to move to Hyderabad and things like that? I said, no, I am in a joint family and I don't think I'll move out of Delhi. There are enough and more opportunities. Uh, so I think uh, these are two things which are rest. And then I think the third one was also... Uh, his commitment and his zeal when uh, he had called all the RPC people at the time when the auditorium of LV Prasad was being constructed and we had the AIOS in uh, Hyderabad, I think it was in the late 80s, uh, at that time it was in the construction phase and then we had a nice, uh, we had to get buses, he arranged for the buses from where the conference venue was to LV Prasad. 
so those are three memories that i have and then obviously i have visited lvp a couple of times and seen the discipline uh, and one particular thing about dr nagrao is that he's a disciplinarian i think he imbibed it from dr lp agarwal uh, uh, when he joined rp center and for him uh, discipline uh, is overarching but something that he has done again uh, which is fantastic is to create a second line of uh, uh, ophthalmologists within lv prasad and i still I remember i don't know when it was but i said sir i want to uh, send you a case of cornea or something he says i don't do clinical work anymore and you can send it to my cornea people they do better than me so that's something which is very very great that you pass on the baton to the second line and create a second line so that the institution that has been created uh, survives uh, and it is not an individualistic uh, institution and that is the big difference between great men and ordinary men uh that is creating an institution by uh by letting others thrive and others being being feeling very proud when others do better than you uh that's uh, that's uh, what one needs to know and dr now thank you very much for this uh, sunday morning taking up your time it's always a, a pleasure to listen to you and uh, you have a very strong and committed team of admirers that you have who have gained so much from you and from your organization and the institution and has helped take indian ophthalmology to the forefront of ophthalmology in the world pleasure thank you very much once again dr nagrao for being with us and uh, uh, we can start uh, i suppose with your uh, interaction your master class uh, thank you thanks so much uh, mahipal and namrata for those uh, generous introductions uh, most of it is a little bloated up uh, mahipal as you are right mahipal then went on from recognizing the epithelial defect to go and work with one of the greatest contributors to the understanding of corneal epithelium mike lamp in washington and he did his fellowship there and uh, and my paul always told me during those days in washington whenever i ran into him at meetings that he was going to replicate lvp in delhi so i said why lvp you should do lvp plus <laughs> and, uh, so that's what the next generation people should do you should go beyond lvp so beyond rp centers beyond sankar netralaya beyond arvins with each generation it has to get better and do more so that should that's the way for progress but anyway thank you so much and what i want to do is uh, my presentation is going to be kind of bits and pieces giving you a few messages and i've spent only 15 20 minutes on that but i want to leave most of the time for you to ask me questions and i'll try and answer to the best of my ability okay let's uh, share the screen now can you see it yes sir Okay, those of us uh, when we are in the residency program, quite often we don't know what to do after the residency. Particularly uh, in our country and in many developing countries. Whereas in the West, for example, they are prepared. They usually. plan these things one to two years in advance they are very clear most of them if not all of them about some important questions or am i going to pursue a practice route or an academic route or do i combine the two if at all possible what is the aim long term plan and they also quite often look at where do i want to be 5 years from now 10 years from now and what impact do i want to make so some of these uh, 
quotes are very inspired. Those of us in the medical profession have to remember these kinds of things more than anybody else, I guess. I feel very sad these days when I see in the newspapers harsh criticism of our medical community and hospitals. But we, sh we should overcome and we can overcome those kinds of criticisms. And this quote is very powerful. One of the greatest values is the belief that the best investment any of us can make is in the lives of others. As physicians, we have immense opportunity to do this. In fact, the life of others and through them the communities and cumulatively nations and the world. When I look back, back at my own journey and I asked myself the question, what was the background for me to initiate the LV Prasada Institute? What all helped me? Inspiration from many institutions and individuals. Experiences throughout my life and exposure to different environments. The motivation to do something different and more. And of course, the support all the way from my spouse to the family, to the friends and the world, wider world. Each of them have contributed. And for most of us, in varying degrees of combinations, the same things matter when we build our careers and we lead our lives. I was inspired by many, many individuals and institutions. And I was fortunate to have had the opportunity to work with some of them directly, some of them indirectly, some of them through reading about them. But by all means, each of those stories was very inspiring. Here are two institutions in America. The left one with the old tower kind of structure is the famous Johns Hopkins Hospital, where we have the world famous Wilmer Eye Institute. The founding story is very inspiring. Ada de Acosta Breckenridge was an young socialite living on Long Island, New York in the 1920s. One day while she was on the beach on Long Island, she started seeing colored halos and then blurred vision. And she went from one ophthalmologist to the other. Various diagnoses were made and treatment was given, but none of them helped her. Finally, at a social gathering, she ran into a British parliamentarian who told her that she was in Washington, D.C. to seek eye consultation from a, an ophthalmologist in Washington. And she asked him about that ophthalmologist, and he encouraged her to go and seek consultation from that ophthalmologist. She went to that ophthalmologist. He diagnosed that she had glaucoma and she needed surgery, performed it, and she got complete relief from her problem. That doctor was Dr. Wilmer. And she, she then thought this enormously talented individual is sitting in this corner of Washington, DC. Many people not knowing about him, his name should be recognized and brought out. And she asked him for the list of all his patients, and he refused to part with it. She later on smuggled that list from his secretary, and many of the people on the list were 
American millionaires. One of them was the famous Andrew Mellon, Andrew Carnegie Mellon in Pittsburgh, the steel giant, steel billionaire of those days. He wrote a letter to him, sought an appointment. He gave her an appointment, but when he went, she went there, he wasn't there. But the secretary said, he left an envelope for you. She refused to accept that envelope, insisted on another appointment, finally met him and convinced him. And he told her in 1924, that he would give her $2 million if she could raise the matching money. She went about, raised the matching amount, and got the two millions from him. And with that $4 million, she started the Wilmarai Institute at Johns Hopkins. Inspiring story, isn't it? And on the right is the famous Bascom Pomeroy Institute voted consecutively for the last 15 years or so as the best eye institute of the U.S. And this was the creation of an ophthalmologist leader, Edward Norton. He was inspired by all the institutions. He was at the Massachusetts Eye and Ear Infirmary, Harvard, as a, on the faculty of that institution after having completed the training there. And then he got the offer by the, from the University of Miami to move to Miami and become a professor. When he moved there, he saw an opportunity and went on to build the Bascom Palmer Eye Institute, the name of a football player from Miami. Dr. Norton mobilized resources, gathered some of the brightest youngsters in American ophthalmology to be on the faculty and created this institution. So that again is an inspiring story. Closer to home, my first inspiration obviously was by mentor, from whom I learned the alphabets of ophthalmology in some sense, the basics of living and succeeding and flourishing. And with the discipline that he instilled and the values that he instilled, I gained a lot. And that made the rest of my career, my professional career. Another inspiration was Dr. Venkata Swami, the founder of Arvind Eye Care System. I was fortunate to have known him most of my life. Dr. Venkat Swami and my father, who was an ophthalmologist too, were colleagues at the Madras Egmore Eye Hospital in the late 40s and early 50s, and we were neighbors in the assistant surgeon's quarters. So I knew him, I knew Nachar, all these people from Marvin system since I was about five years old. And he has always been a source of inspiration for me, more so after I got into medical college and then into ophthalmology. And he was one of the first people who was all set to help us, guide us, when I decided to return to India and start an eye center in Hyderabad. So here's his story again was the saga of inspiration. A man who built an institution post his retirement from government service. Again, discipline, focus for his secrets. The other person who showed us in India that subspecialty development and building it and practicing it successfully is possible was Dr. Badrina of Shankar Netrala. When I was a house surgeon during the year, I was a house surgeon in an RP center. Badri just returned from the US after completing his residency and fellowship with world famous Dr. Charles Capels in Retina. Professor, he came there for a, looking for a job. Professor Agarwal actually told him that I would create the position to join as a pool officer now 
and then we'll create the professor of assistant professor and then take him. But in the meanwhile, he went to visit his native place, Chennai. And from there, people there convinced him that he should stay back and build his own thing. So it was RP Center's loss and again for Chennai. And that resulted in the creation of the now famous Asankar Netra. Here is another gentleman who has inspired me since my medical student days and perhaps responsible for me aspiring to make research as part of my career. A professor Ramalinga Swami. He was the one of the renowned pathologists in the world in his days, one of the leading medical scientists of India ever, former director of the All India Institute of Medical Sciences, and then former director general of ICMR. He was always uh, an inspiring figure. During my medical college days, he came and delivered a lecture at our college. And that lecture turned the switch on in me. That day, without knowing even the spelling of the word research properly, I have decided that I should pursue research. And later on, several times, I met him. He inspired me. He encouraged me. And when we returned, he was a fully supportive of that. And what an inspiring figure he was, a tall figure in Indian science and Indian healthcare. So when we think of what is possible after ophthalmology residency, traditionally, we think of most of us, if not all of us, clinical practice. But there are so many other possibilities. You could be an academic leader. You could excel as a pure clinician, nothing wrong with that. You could be an excellent ophthalmic educator. You could be somebody who get into public health and create impactful programs, both nationally and globally. You could get into cutting edge research and you could also be a, a leader in developing eye hospitals and eye health programs and lead them. Whatever you do, what you should aim for is to excel and focus in whatever you do. Clinical ophthalmology very few can stand out as exceptional clinical ophthalmologists. And you should aim to become one of the few. And certainly a large percentage of us end up becoming clinical ophthalmologists. But only a minor fraction really move to the top among that. And you have to get inspired by such people, get to know them, learn about them, Try and learn during your residency as much as possible. Not only the technology part and the surgical techniques, but also the knowledge behind all those techniques and technologies. Once you have that combination and you continue to update your knowledge, you become a very competent clinical ophthalmologist. You can also be, also be a clinical plus. Very few of us, hardly any, very small, minor fragment, would like to give up clinical work completely. But where you can become an academic ophthalmologist, that means, I, by that I mean clinical plus, in varying combinations. It could be clinical plus education, clinical plus research, clinical plus public health. And these are beautifully done even among Western countries in the US. Not so much even in Europe or Japan, but US 
universities encourage that and they give you dedicated time to pursue these other areas in addition to your clinical responsibilities. The same thing is possible for us in India. America is kind of languishing now and now is the time for us to fill that gap and space from India and because we have the wherewithal to fill that gap. So some of you can combine your clinical path for practice by becoming educators. Some of you may want to pursue research. Research doesn't have to be complicated. Don't get scared by the word research. If you learn to document every single medical record in detail, when you are seeing your patients, each one of those documents will become a research document. Out of that analysis of those number of cases that you see, you can come out with new knowledge, new techniques, and suggest the development of new technologies. So clinical practice done well will make you a much better clinical ophthalmologist, provides you pieces of information and documents for excellent clinical research. And then those of you who have the aptitude for laboratory research, by all means, you should pursue it. I suggest, and I hope in future, our academic programs and residency programs will allow for a few months of rotation in basic research laboratories for those who are interested in pursuing basic research post their residency training. Short of that, before you jump into residency, you could probably go and spend a year in a basic research laboratory or post residency a year and see how you end up liking it. But if you like it, I'm sure I can tell you, you will really enjoy getting into basic research because we have the unique ability as clinicians when we deal with the problems, out of those problems, we can create questions for research. And when you're also a researcher, you can immediately pursue the questions and try and find the answers and the solutions. So clinical plus research is a powerful combination. There are some of us who combine all these three, clinical, part teaching, and part research. In research, the most difficult part and the one that requires utmost discipline is to sit and write, write the manuscripts. I would say from your residency days, try to get into the habit of learning, learning writing. If you get into the habit of writing from now on and you slowly improve, by the time you've complete residency, you will be ready. Or you can get into public health and pursue similar interests. I can give you stories of some inspiring stories here of people who combined these so well. I don't know how many of you know the name Herbert Kaufman. Herb was a pioneering cornea specialist one of the most brilliant people that I have ever encountered in my life. Herb, when he completed his medical school at Harvard, went and spent a couple of years at the NIH doing research. And then he got residency training admission at the Massachusetts Eye and Ear Infirmary, ranked number one program at that time. And the first day he went there, he went up to the chairman, Dr. David Cogan, and asked him, Dr. Cogan, unless you give me my own laboratory for me to conduct research while I'm doing residency, I'm not going to take up this spot. I'm going to another university where they will offer me my own lab and my own research facilities. That was the confidence he had when he approached the chairman of the department of Harvard and demand that and Dr. Kogan readily agreed and provided him that facility. 
With that, Herb, during his third year of residency, discovered the treatment for herpes simplex called keratitis. That was IDU. Another example was Bernard Becker, the famous glaucoma legend. Becker and Schaefer glaucoma book, many of you may have read. And Becker was a resident at Wilmer Eye Institute. And during the years of his residency, he discovered the treatment of glaucoma with the Diamox. So there are many such stories and simple observations, I was telling you, clinical observations, how they make strong research base. The example of Morton Goldberg, who later on became the director of Wilmer Eye Institute. Mort apparently used to draw every single blood vessel on the conjunctiva in the medical documentation in all his patients. That's how intensive he was in his documentation. And when he was doing that, after a few years, he had found some interesting phenomena, corkscrew blood vessels in some of the patients, conjunctiva. And that aroused his curiosity. He went and pulled all those medical records. And when he analyzed them, out came and looked at the retina of these patients, out came the sickle cell eye disease and the sickle cell retinopathy, which he described again as a recipient. Simple clinical observations, rigorous documentation led to that description. So just imagine every one of us have such opportunities. And I keep on challenging our residents and fellows, when this happens in America, why is it not happening here? Why can't we do it? Just have to be focused and have the discipline to do these things. Yet another area where each of you have immense opportunities is an ophthalmologist manager, either clinical, of general management or other kinds of research management and other skills. Some of us have the aptitude to do these kinds of things. And by all means, you should pursue that. In addition uh, to your clinical practice, and after a few years, one might choose to become exclusively an ophthalmologist manager. And finally, this special group of people, the ophthalmic leaders. These are usually academic ophthalmologists with aptitude for management and can look into the future and envision the future and develop strategies for the future, the visionary people. And several publications in the business literature in America have shown among all the successful medical centers and hospitals in the US, the ones led by medical leaders were the most successful, not by Harvard MBAs, but by the medical leaders. So ophthalmic leaders can become very successful entrepreneurs. Mahipal Sachdev, there is a great example of that. And I often talk about us becoming 3H, ophthalmologists, to become good with our hands, acquire knowledge using our head, and use our heart to become a real physician. And that combination, I say if you just are good with your hands and not with other things, you are an average ophthalmologist. If you are good with your hands and head, you are a good ophthalmologist. If you have all three, you become excellent ophthalmologist. If you combine those with ethics and values in whatever you do, you become an exceptional ophthalmologist and a, a real physician. As we move into the future, the knowledge and technology, a lot of it will be taken over by the technological innovations. And 
we may not have to remember too many things. But what is going to make a difference is the caring physicians, the real physicians who care for their patients, those who have the caring attitude. They become exceptional doctors and they make all the difference. And throughout your life, our parents give us some values through our teachers in schools, colleges, medical schools, and residency, we acquire some values. And by the time we get out of residency, we have some foundation of values. Whatever values we acquire through your exposure experiences in life, stick to them. Don't keep changing your values. A value-based individual as well as a value-based organization are the ones which sustain much longer, very successfully. We also have not only, I'm just throwing this pyramid not to talk about LVP, but just to show you a model and the opportunities. Our opportunity is not just limited to the tertiary level care. Most of the ophthalmologists will have to practice at the secondary level secondary level of care, that is mostly cataract surgery, diagnosis of disease and medical treatment, some lasers, etc. So whatever we do there, we have to equip ourselves to become a good comprehensive ophthalmologist. So by the time you finish residency, you should acquire skills to do all this in a safe manner with good patient care outcomes. And above that, of course, some of us who pursue subspecialties and academics go into tertiary and advanced tertiary levels. And there are opportunities for you to innovate and develop a cluster of secondary centers. If you're working in tertiary centers, you can mentor either your own or somebody else's secondary centers and help them upgrade their quality, do their capacity building, train their people, etc. Similarly, there's a lot of opportunity now, particularly came to light and prominence through the pandemic over the last two years. No longer will the ICAM survive in the future. We need to have permanent facilities in the remote rural and rural areas, primary eye care centers. And you should understand the concept of these primary centers, learn how to create them and run them as part of your own practice, or you link up with a cluster of primary and secondary centers. So in all this, you have an opportunity to innovate, to create, to help, to mentor. These are the 10 functional segments of LVP. So I'm showing this just to show you the opportunities that we have. Each one of these areas is an opportunity for you when you come out. Clinical care, of course. Eye banking, for those of you who want to go into cornea, it's a huge opportunity. India is on the verge of expansion. While we have made rapid strides over the past two decades, we still have a long way to go. One area that we have neglected and continue to neglect, unfortunately, is the vision rehabilitation. Here again, some of our ophthalmologists, if you develop interest, can become leaders in addition to your clinical practice by providing those with permanent vision disabilities with appropriate care and realize their full potential to function like normal sighted individuals. As I already alluded to about education, you can help other organizations in their capacity building. Research, of course, rural and community health. I would urge all of you to allocate part of your time at least to this segment wherever you practice, whatever kind of practice you do. Because remember, 70% of Indians live in rural areas. As educated Indians, 
and privileged Indians, it is our responsibility to worry about them and care for them. Technology innovation and innovation in other areas, some of you who have the aptitude for technological tools, you can combine your clinical practice with technology innovation and develop tools that could develop low-cost technology diagnostic tools that will in turn help the fruits of best of technology to the most disadvantaged people in our country and the world. And out of this, you could also get into product development and become an entrepreneur. Nothing wrong with that. You can combine your practice with entrepreneurship. And finally, a very, very neglected area is we never think of advocacy as a powerful tool to protect our turf, to protect our specialty, to protect healthcare, and compete with others for governmental recognition, getting onto the radar screens of the policymakers. And we should be making the policy, formulating the policy, not the bureaucrats. We should be participating in healthcare and eye care planning activity. And I would even encourage some of us who have the aptitude to get into politics and be clean politicians if we can. Bring about a change in the thinking of, about political life. So in each of these areas, every one of you that are participating in this discussion today have an opportunity. You can do one or a combination of two, three of these things. And you have the opportunity to succeed. The very fact that you have succeeded in getting admission to a medical school and then a residency training program, you are all bright individuals. If you use your talent and intelligence, you can do a lot more than what you think you are cut out for. Just think beyond, think beyond the horizons that you are seeing today. So we should all contribute to this concept of universal health, of comprehensive care, that is prevention, treatment, and rehabilitation. And whatever you do, wherever you do, let's commit to quality. Let there be continuity of care to the communities where we go and provide care, permanent facilities. Take as much care closer to the doorstep of the people as possible. Because this past year at LVP, we had that experience. The first group of our centers to recover to 100% and then went on to 150 to 170% volumes, pre-COVID volumes, for our secondary and primary centers, while our tertiary centers were still inching between 80 to 100%. So the future is going to be in distributed care. More and more people would like to seek care closer to their doorstep. We have to plan our future accordingly. And of course, we have to learn to work with communities where communities actively participate in healthcare and education. Those communities have high quality healthcare and education. It's my strong belief. And we should be the active participant in those debates and discussions and mobilize people. I just want, I don't know if the, this uh, video clip plays, but I wish it does. <laughs> I'm sorry, it doesn't. It's a very powerful video. I don't know if any of your technology people out there, Namrata, can help. Sunil, can you help to play the video? Sunil? Sunil All right. Can you help? That's okay. Otherwise, I leave you with this famous quote from J.K. Rowling. Uh, this is what she said at the conclusion of her Harvard graduation speech in the year 2009. Your intelligence, your capacity for hard work, the education you have earned and received give you a unique status and unique responsibilities. That's your privilege and your burden. 
if you choose to identify not only with the powerful, but with the powerless, if you retain the ability to imagine yourself into the lives of those who do not have your advantages, then it will not only be your proud families to celebrate your existence, but thousands and millions of people whose reality you have helped to change. My young friends, we all have fit into this criteria. We are privileged, we have the intelligence, we have the capacity for hard work, we have the education. I'm reminded of a conversation I had with one of the high court judges a couple of years ago. I ran into him in one of the airports and he told me, doctor, you know, you are getting wealthier and wealthier each day. I got a little taken aback. Why was he saying that? And I said, what do you mean? He said, I don't know if you ever think. Every morning when they open their eyes, millions of people must be giving their blessings to you. What better wealth can you acquire than that? And I thought that was such a powerful message. Each of you can acquire that kind of wealth and go out into the world. As they say, our profession has a unique advantage. Go out into the world and do well. But more importantly, go out into the world and do good. And our profession provides an incredible opportunity to combine these two of doing well and doing good. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Rao. I think uh, it was such an inspiring and a mesmerizing uh, presentation. So insightful with all your experiences. And uh, you just opened so many other avenues, which I think uh, even, even we had not thought about. I mean, it was inspiring for everybody, one and all. So uh, Sunil, can you help to play the video? Sunil? Yes, Dr. Rao. Yeah. Ma'am, uh, do you want yeah. me to play it from uh, uh, just uh, when you are sharing, just share the computer sound once. But just click on share screen once. Okay. And the pop up, uh, there is a bottom left, there is something called share computer sound. Yeah. So you have to come to the video, I think, the slide which says the video. I think it was the second last slide. This one it says remote control. Oh, second last slide. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Yeah. So you'll have to come to the second last slide, Dr. Rao. Oh, okay. Click the second last slide. Yes. Come to the yeah bottom yes the video slide yeah. twenty four yeah now now what's new just uh, they have to play it just click it uh, I think it should be able to is embedded or sir it's separate just on the slide itself is it embedded in the presentation sir yeah okay so if you just click on the can screen. you just click on the play button sir? Maybe you may have to go to full screen, then maybe. Yeah, if you go to full screen. Yes. Go back one. Yeah. Just, just click on the video and play. You have to go back. Go back. Full screen. Full screen. Ankit says if you. Yeah, yes, yes, yes. Just ensure it is done. You may have to click on the enable content yeah. first. Yeah, maybe, maybe that can be tried. I was also the, thinking. The, the dialogue had to be said yes. Yeah, not yeah. So, the security thing has to be acknowledged. It has to be affirmative or positive. Affirmative. Yes. Okay. 
for that you have to, you will have to go back to the same slide sort of mode no you have to you have to press you yes. will have to stop share and reshare then when the dialog comes you will have to say yes stop share and share again yes yes and, and this time when the security dialog come you will have to say yes yes don't don't uh, uh, just cross it just say yes it will enable the content then share screen share screen again okay. full screen no but the dialog has not come the security dialog should come no i don't see it <laughs> anyway i think i probably will see at the end whether i cut the pull it out and show it okay okay maybe you can stop sharing sir yeah so uh, i think uh, as, you see, as you see that i am not very technology competent no no you are very technology competent <laughs> so uh, it is open for discussion now so uh, anybody would want to ask you can ask anything and everything so dr rao thank you very much for uh, an uh, excellent uh, overview as to what all are the opportunities i think you should Uh, my two senses add one more slide and that is if you don't love ophthalmology get out of it <laughs> <laughs> so so that's another possibility because sometimes people do get in into ophthalmology by default and if your heart and your mind doesn't lie there in ophthalmology i think uh, it's uh, not uh, there are enough and more option nowadays in this uh, developing world that uh, you uh, you need not flog a dead horse so if you if you are not focused and passionate about what you are doing it doesn't make sense so yeah. i think uh, uh, that's <laughs> that's the only thing i am saying it's never too late that's something that i when i was uh, in us i realized that um, uh, i worked with bill mathers too uh, who's done a lot of work on tear osmolarity and mybography we did, uh, 89 90 we worked on this mybography that's become commercially available now but uh, he he uh, he at the age of 45 became an ophthalmologist after having worked as a associate professor of anesthesia so yeah. so, so that's all that's all that i'm saying is that the opportunity is abound a lot and um, in case you don't love ophthalmology leave ophthalmology <laughs> so dr digvijay would you want to uh, you are representing all the young ophthalmologists of the country would you want to say uh, anything or would you want to ask sir anything yes sir uh, dr jain rao sir that was a lovely presentation great inspiration i think for all the young ophthalmologists th there's another photograph of yours that goes along with the inspiring leaders that we have seen so far so uh, very nice sir. very amazing and you are a true inspiration for all of us uh, i'm representing sir as president of the young ophthalmologists society of india all the young ophthalmologists uh, you know all of us below 40 who are in training as well and one thing that has often come across in our discussions and what we've looked at is that you know across the country which india is such a wide country the the level of residency training or probably the level even of some fellowship trainings is not really standard it's not across the board and there are many such uh, courses which you know even at the end of it you're not really prepared for practice or probably you know for a lot of what you've already mentioned is there something that you know uh, the young ophthalmologists the residents the students in training can do in addition to their standard course that they're doing to kind of help them prepare for practice prepare for further academics or prepare you know for taking participating in research or other activities sir i mean you know what would you what was your advice for all of us you know you're right the standard of our residency training across the country is so variable and the fellowship training the two things that need to be fixed and a voice can play a big advocacy role with the government there is to have basic minimum standards of residency training and the second thing is engage very actively and probably aggressively in the faculty development one of the biggest weaknesses of our residency programs is weak faculty hardly 
maybe 10% of residency programs have the right kind of faculty. Because most of the faculty never had an opportunity. I'm sure they can be trained, a lot of them. There is a, a spark somewhere hidden and we have to ignite that. And I think that's what we have to do from the, at the top level. I think it will take probably five to 10 years if we start now to create a, a framework for high quality residency training in the country, across the country and everywhere. The second right now, the immediate things for residents in working in relatively weaker programs, both AIOS along with the institutions that offer good education should create education templates, platforms to help the residents. Now, I think during the past two years, many have developed online education platforms, various types of technology platforms are now available and we should leverage them and take it to full exploitation for the resident training. Not only the, not so much the didactic part that anybody can read from books or the journals, but more interactive. And then even to some degree, a simulator kind of approach for hands-on training. And that's where we should be doing and focus on residents. And actually we try to do sometime in LVP deliberately on top of our regular fellows, we take a couple who come from weaker residency programs to give them an opportunity. They may spend extra time here. And we also ask our faculty to individually monitor such people, mentor such people. And we see them for about six months and if, we, if they have the aptitude, if they are sincere and they're willing to learn, we give them all our support. But of course, if they don't show any aptitude and support, then, uh, then we let them go after six months or whatever. But we certainly want to give them opportunity. Because I realize I have seen uh, many in my life, right from my medical school days, the residency doors, those who ended up with every gold medal. You don't hear too much about them. Quite often, it's the so-called average and above average that have come to the top. So somewhere along the line, there is that spark. That spark has to be ignited at the right time by the right people and the right opportunity. So what we should start up with is everybody has the potential. That's the premise. And we should try and make everybody better. It's easy to give up on people, but it's more difficult to, to make them better. So we should adopt weaker training programs. And here uh, at LVP, we're trying to work with the residency programs in the three states that we are located and see how best we can do to help them. We have the eco platform with which uh, we do a number of uh, sessions with them. And uh, some of our faculty visits these places to literally handhold the faculty through surgical procedures, et cetera. So, but we can do so, only so much. So if all the institutions in the country can together work as a program, maybe uh, spearheaded by AOS, Namrata and um, Man, Ma, Ma, Mahipal, this is a huge opportunity you guys can bring the revolution in residency training. I think you focus on residency training, doesn't matter about all other things. You would have made a major contribution to the country. I think, uh, I think that is the way to go and I'm sure, and we will uh, make it happen at the AIOS platform in the time that we have with us, uh, surely. Uh, Dr. Divakant, would you want to say something? Sure, ma'am. Uh, thank you, sir, for taking out time on a Sunday morning and delivering such an inspiring talk. My question is uh, sort of a follow-up to what uh, Dr. Dikvijay just asked. 
So in light of the current status of uh, the residency programs that we discussed, how important is it to pursue a fellowship? And more importantly, uh, will it be difficult to achieve success as an ophthalmologist without a proper fellowship program? No, fellowship is not an essential requirement, provided you went through a good residency training program. If you, at the end of the residency training, if one is qualified to become a good comprehensive ophthalmologist, by that I mean somebody who can diagnose all diseases and provide medical treatment, safe cataract surgeon, simple glaucoma squint kind of surgeries, seal the peripheral retinal holes, laser for diabetic retinopathy, if they can do that, that should be the aim of every residency training. These are all the aims. I often challenge our people. If our residency training cannot provide our residents these skills by the time they finish, let's close down our residency. There's no point in having yet another residency of mediocre quality. So if you have good residency training, there is no need for fellowship. A good comprehensive ophthalmologist does not require a fellowship. The fellowship should be for people who went through a poorer residency training who need additional education. That's for them. And for those who want to pursue subspecialties. So these are the two groups that need fellowship. Colonel, uh, do you want to ask uh, something? Morning, yes. Thank you, Thank you very much. So uh, this was a uh, really inspiring talk and uh, like you were the quintessence of a true mentor and ophthalmic leader. So how much of your success uh, as a as a leader and your, you know, your entire vision of uh, sort of mission in life has been, you know, how, would, how much of your success would you attribute to your international exposure? And should that be a real priority for uh, young ophthalmologists? Yeah, international exposure uh, gave me, I would say, an icing on the cake kind of thing, which we don't realize until we go out and really look back. The older I got, the more I realized. The first 10 years of my life, I grew up in a village. That was a unique opportunity given by my parents. I would have missed it because my father was still in medical school and doing his post-graduation during that time. My parents left me with my aunt. So I grew up in a village until I was 10 years old. A village of 2,000 people. In those days, villages in India have no electricity, no water, nothing like that. So I really knew what village life was, what they go through, what kind of difficulties the rural people have. That, I think, has made me stronger for the rest of my life. I didn't realize it at that time. But I think the older I got, the more I valued that. And every single exposure from that time, the, the dedicated government school teachers that we went to, government high schools, how, gra how great they were. My English teacher used to make us exercises from each sentence in our test. Our Telugu teachers were well-known Telugu poets. These were the kinds of people we had in government schools teaching. So that again is a big benefit. And then of course, the first real transformation and maturation for me happened at RP Center. Okay, that was the first time I was away from home on my own in a strange place, Delhi, North India. Didn't know a word of Hindi when I landed there. <laughs> so, but the four years of uh, getting beaten up by everybody there made me stronger, prepared me for the world, and prepared me for my ophthalmology career in every aspect of it. You know, the first time I thanked Professor Agarwal, uh, when I went for the fellowship in Boston, I used to go for the grand rounds at Mass and The very first day I went there, all the questions their third year residents who were supposed to be the creme de la creme of American medical schools could not answer, I knew the answers. Then I thought to myself and said, thank you, Professor Agarwal. 
But during the time in RP center, we used to moan and groan. He's killing us. He's not giving us time for anything else. This and that. I, I hope the RP center residents are listening to it. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then that's the day. No, even now our fellows and residents, I tell them, you can moan and groan. You can curse me. But I know you will all thank five, ten years later. Because that's at that age and at that stage of your life, you naturally feel that way. But that was the first day I said, thank you, Professor Agarwal. So that's how it happens. So every one of those, and then the international exposure, working with them, with Dr. Jules Baum, with whom I worked first. And then I was working in the research laboratory of one of the legends in infectious disease, antibiotics, Louis Weinstein. He used to write the antibiotics chapter in Goodman and Gilman in those days. So we were, our project was antibiotic penetration to the eye. So working with such people in those laboratories, that environment inspires you. And then with Jules, I learned, I added one more layer of rigor that Professor Agarwal imparted. With Jules Baum, if I missed one spot of SPK in the cornea, I had it. We had to draw diagrams and couldn't afford to miss anything. So that gives you rigor. Then with Jim Aquavella, I learned the meticulous nature of surgical techniques. Every single step. How meticulous one should be. How everybody, you should know everything about the, every piece of equipment and instrument that you are using. He would not let you touch a microscope until we read everything about the microscope. He would not let us touch the slit lamp until we knew everything about the slit lamp. So those were all the things that you acquired and learned and you got better through that. So then, of course, exposure to multiple luminaries in the field of ophthalmology around the world. Formal inter informal interactions, talking to them, getting ideas from them, all that. So one example I give you, I used to ask George Waring, I don't know, you probably don't know him. You may have read his books and uh, papers. Superb orator. I used to ask him, George, how did you become such a great orator? He said he was teaching Sunday school during his college days in church. Out of that habit, he became a very powerful orator. And then he told me he and Jake Ratchmer, who were co-fellows with Peter Leibson, used to challenge each other at the end of the day, each day, take a couple of patients to the slit lamp and challenge each other as to who would find the most findings in the corner. And that's how they both became outstanding. And they brought out an atlas of corneal disease in those days. So these are all simple, doable, inexpensive habits that make each of us better. So those exposures, those conversations, those stories, like I told you about Wilmer, Bascom, Palmer, reading about those institutions. So I read a lot of medical history that inspires me. So there is a saying, those who don't have historic knowledge don't have a future. Sometimes it is disappointing. As the story I told you about Wilmer. A few years ago, I was talking to the Wilmer residents at their place. And I asked them to tell me how this institute got started. None in that elite group of residents knew the answer. So it is a point. So those who go to Wilmer as residents are the best of American medical schools. So I think all the residents and the fellows now, uh, it is open for you if you want to ask anything. Uh, Dr. G. N. Rao, Dr. Mahipal sir is also here. Rajesh is also here. So it is open for discussion. Now, Prakyat, would you want to say something? Uh, thank you, sir. It was a very uh, horizon expanding 
kind of talk very different from what usually webinars are and it it is a very refreshing change i have a question uh, that going into uh, practice after completing your fellowship or senior residency most of the people who have been in good academic institutions under good mentors wish to continue that academic journey in their clinical practice which you which you said is clinical plus basically but uh, somehow on their way they find either a few barriers that they cannot overcome or are not willing to overcome or the infrastructure or setup in their practice whether stand alone or in a group practice becomes uh, becomes not feasible for continuing that uh, so what do you think should be the essential aspects that one should uh, one should uh, care for and you know uh, continue developing in their clinical practice so that they can continue this journey of academics and research you know there is a popular adage if you want something badly enough you can get it how badly you want it is the question so if you are, if you want badly enough to become a academician also while doing your clinical practice you have to work and setting up the structure accordingly like i was telling you some simple steps every single medical record of yours should make it into a research document and then you begin small with the accumulated knowledge from the small series of cases that you may have suppose you have only a very limited series then you work to your, with your like minded friends collaborate and together you could make an impactful publications impactful presentations but don't give up the habit and you talk to your mentors you talk to people who have had experience who have traveled that journey earlier learn from them that a constant interaction and learning from the people the practical tips in a given situation what did they do how did they overcome they'll give you a lot of uh, answers and you can certainly do it and again uh, there are many people like I, i i know some people at the university of rochester in rochester city leading private practitioners not in ophthalmology alone but other specialties the way they lead their life i give you one example a gentleman that i knew very well a renowned internal internist every single morning he used to go to the library of the university at 7 and he would be in the library reading all the current journals until 8:30 and then go home had breakfast with his family and then went to his office practice day after day after day five days a week he did that and he was a clinical professor at the university and an outstanding teacher and he published along with the professors at the university so i'm just giving one example the many such like that but you have to develop your schedule a disciplined life and similarly i used to ask people how do you write so much how do you publish so much again george waring was a good example i asked him how do you he, every month with there used to be a paper from from him in one of the journals and he said three days a week for his family he was just not available and he used to go home at the end of the day have dinner with his family and back in his office and work until midnight and that's when he wrote every single week three days a week consistent same three days they don't change each week and it's as if they he's out of town for the family on those three days so he said the more time like that that one can spend the more output will be there is no big secret is and there are several others i saw they work in groups two three of them get together shut themselves in a room one day a week and that's the time they write 
So these are all the things that when you talk to people, you here when you get all the all the tips how we can become more productive. And a lot of us are very bad in time management. Like uh, one thing uh, I learned related to patient care, which many of us neglect, but I learned the hard way was. Initially in Rochester, I used to dictate the referral letters on Saturday morning for the entire week. Those cases referred to us to send letters to the doctors who refer. So it used to take half a day. Half a day of Saturday is gone. Then I thought it was too much wastage, so I started doing end of the day. It used to take one and a half, two hours, end of the day, every time I was seeing patients. Then again, is there a better way? Then I talked to some people and I got the idea. When I see a patient, before I go to the next patient, I used to dictate the letter right then and there in front of the patient. So you take only two minutes because you remember everything fresh in your memory. You don't have to verify the record. You don't have to spend more time. So by the end of the day, when I finished with my outpatients, all my referral letters are done. Nothing pending. And then I read a book on Hillary Clinton. She said she never looked at a letter that came to her desk a second time. That means she would respond to each letter the very first time. Normally, what do we do? We read it, we put it aside and read it again. We put it aside three times, we read and waste time. If you look at it, the mail we get, 80% of it is two, three sentences answer. You can immediately answer those and clear them but we don't do it. So that is where the discipline comes and time management. So you can do excellent clinical practice, you can do research and you can publish clinical research. But you can also do basic research. There are some people who are private practice and did outstanding basic research. The example is Anthony Nesburn in Los Angeles, again a leader in herpes simplex and viral infections of the cornea. He had a huge private practice. For two days a week, he was in his lab. Three days in practice, two days in the lab. Oh, I think uh, there are two questions in the chat box, Dr. Devakant and Dr. Raghav Malik. Uh, they want to ask you on a few aspects of ophthalmology, whether they should be a part of the residency training program or not, Devakant. Vakant is not there. Raghav, uh, you can go ahead with your... Um, good afternoon, sir. Thank you for a very insightful um, presentation. So I would like to know that uh, I want your opinion on whether you think that uh, tele or video ophthalmology is now here to stay. And if it is here to stay, then how can the current uh, residency programs with their limitations, technology, in the, especially the backward areas of our country, how can they incorporate this in their curricula? And the outgoing residents, how can they... Uh, we are part of this because we know that we have patients now that are doing tele ophthalmology consultations and coming back to us with the OPD and then again with lockdown coming and going. Do you think is that here to stay and how can we change the curricula if needed? Tele ophthalmology is here to stay and it will improve. A lot of different versions are available, but. I think the most successful practice is what I call it, is not artificial intelligence, it is extended intelligence, as they call it, the natural plus artificial. So whichever practices or institutions can combine the best of talent with the best of technology are going to be the successful ones. So your talent still counts. And if you are very well equipped in your training, and if you are a good doctor, the element that is missing in technology that can never be replaced by technology is, as I was alluding to earlier, the caring. The caring. Caring is beyond treatment. How much do you care for that individual? When a patient comes to us, they are coming up, coming to us with a problem. And if they think that we really care for them and provide the care, they like us. The technology can never replace that. So actually the 
Google group, when they did the artificial intelligence, they actually recognized that. They even said that the future doctors who are going to be successful are the ones who are very strong in the character, in the trait of caring. They will succeed because your knowledge acquisition, your diagnosis will be replaced a lot by technology. And on top of that, when you provide that caring element, that's what will make you successful. So it's a, I would say it's a three T's, technology plus talent plus tenderness. How tender you are in your care to your patients. How do you relieve their feeling of suffering? You may have seen some very successful practitioners, the way they converse with patients. Right with that, the patient feels very good. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, we have uh, uh, representatives from all the institutes. I think I would. there's a question posted by Gunjan. Would you want to ask? Where are you from, Ankit? Uh, Raghav Malik asked the question. He's from Center for Sight. And Dr. Prakhyat Roop was from RP Center who asked the question. And uh, I think we will go center-wise and uh, take uh, inputs from everybody. Gunjan, you posted a question again from RP Center. She's in final year of her senior residency, just about to finish. How many more months? I think a couple of months more. So yes, your question. Uh, good afternoon, sir. I would like to ask you, after our senior residency and fellowship, most of us move to new cities. So how to adjust and outshine in those new cities? And what were the problems you had faced while you were establishing the center? And how did you overcome them? It's like when you came to residency, how did you come? Where did you come from? Where did you come from? Sir, I am from Chhattisgarh. So Chhattisgarh to Delhi is a big jump like for me from uh, small town Andhra Pradesh to Delhi in those days. So you made that switch. You succeeded, obviously, with the fact that you were selected for senior residency. You must have done very well as a junior resident. So it's the same one more step from what you are. You are going to a new place. When I came to Hyderabad, uh, believe it or not, I'm not from Hyderabad. I never lived in Hyderabad. The longest I ever stayed in Hyderabad was about five days before that. I didn't know many people, no connections. So you just go. Go with your plan, work on the details, and stick with the plan. Don't keep on changing because X said that, Y said this. Because in the early years, everybody told me the idea that we have LVP will not work. This is not, they, I used to hear 100 times a day, this is not America, this is not America. I said, I, said, I know it is not America. So you just keep smiling and keep going, that's it. You, you set your plan. Work on the details. Once you have your destination clear, and then you sort out the route to reach your destination, keep walking on that route. Don't get distracted, don't get pushed or pulled from that route. Okay. So you have to acquire, you may have to start small. You may have to, depending on your ability to mobilize resources. And if you are from a wealthy family or if you are already a child of a, a physician family, you have an advantage. But if you don't, I don't think you have to despair. You can still start small. And if you are a high quality doctor, people will get to know about it. The key is 95 plus percent of patients that come to you, when they leave, they say, wow. And with that feeling, if they leave, you will have no problem. You don't need any advertisement. They will do you, your advertisement. So uh, I think, Gunjan, that answers your question. We have uh, from Arvind Eye Hospital, Dr. Yamini. I'm not taking LVPI or... Yeah. Yeah. Yes, Yamini, would you want to ask? Uh, yeah. Uh, 
good afternoon sir uh, thank you for your inspiring speech uh, so my question is uh, when uh, how do we proceed or how do we go about with uh, thinking about fellowships abroad so if i want uh, let's say glaucoma or cornea so how do i proceed with uh, uh, you know for applying for fellowships abroad and what is your take on that sir this is after residency or after fellowship um both sir maybe after residency after fellowship how do we go about rest or fellowships applying for, when we try to apply abroad my advice would be now after residency i would advise you to do a fellowship in india there are some good fellowships in the country you become good at it acquire all the knowledge everything competence required here and then you go abroad for a year or whatever length of time you want to then you would get maximum out of that exposure and uh, if you go right after residency in most countries you may not get the opportunity to get full clinical exposure and participation it's a tough thing and it's getting worse i think uh, us now i see uh, but highly talented people they are taking them straight on to the faculty too even from india i know a couple of examples recently that went from here and as full professors to the universities in the us that said that never used to happen we never used to get even a license in those days when we went if we didn't have some training in america but now the things have changed so extraordinarily qualified people they already try to always try to acquire them and that's opened up to now indians and i'm very happy about it but the only negative side is we are going to lose some of our very high high end talent in the years to come at the senior level and uh, no i think uh, i would suggest if you are a resident now in the area that you want to pursue do a fellowship here and then go for a fellowship in the us and go to a good program there are many fellowships even abroad every fellowship because it is in england or america is not good there are fellowships you can count on fingers that are of high quality even there so you get the best training here and then go and if it is post fellowship sure you can certainly apply and identify an area identify the person with whom you want to work with or the persons and write to them they may give you opportunities thank you sir basitali again from arvindai hospital dr basitali you want to where are you from yamini yamini uh, so i am from chennai uh, i am from chennai sir and uh, i am studying my I'm doing my dnb in arvindai hospital pondicherry okay great thank you sir basitali good afternoon sir was uh, give us a new pathways to see further in ophthalmology uh, like uh, ophthalmology manager and all it was a new talk uh, so my question will be what will be as you said in artificial intelligence it uh, it will uh, what will be the future for us in artificial intelligence i think there is a lot of future i, I have to must admit that my knowledge of technology is very limited artificial intelligence seems to have a lot of promise i would say still it's a an area of promise it's not something that is yet proven be a routine thing in healthcare because if it is a routine care all over the western countries they have been practicing it in every clinic and everywhere and i, I don't see that happen so it's still not routine it's still in evolution but there is a lot of promise and uh, i think they will only reach that and they involve us the physicians in the development of the artificial intelligence solutions as long as there are products done just by technology people they will never be optimal i can guarantee you that we have the experience in the past. medical records developed by just technologists around the world they are harder and then when the professionals got involved in the development of electronic medical records they got better 
because then they become user friendly similarly unless they have strong inputs from the professionals into the development of these solutions and technology solutions they won't be sustainable and they will not be very successful thank you sir uh, from pgi chandigarh we have dr manik sardana and dr kiran uh, yes good afternoon good afternoon sir so i would like to ask uh, what to how to choose between a senior residency or a fellowship i am just about to complete my uh, residency here so how to choose between a senior residency and fellowship what are the pros and cons of each really i wish i could answer that question i don't know i thought they are both about the same so, it's a, it's so i think uh, what uh, happens is like uh, in uh, rp center as well as in uh, pgi chandigarh Uh, when they talk about residency, they they mean junior residency, which is their MD uh, or MS of Pharmacy, and after that it becomes a difficult decision for them whether to do senior residency in the same institutes provided you know they are getting it there, or to pursue a fellowship say in LBPI or Arvind or Center for Sight or uh, wherever. So I think the trend that is there in RP Center is that they try to apply for senior residency. and if they don't get you know then they go there but now i think the trend is also changing that used to be there earlier uh, they are very clear on you know what they want if they want a particular uh, subject they would you know just go in for a for a fellowship so uh, i think uh, basically uh, dr manik wants to ask about that yeah what happens is uh, as a culture and tradition in our country we are very shy of change whereas in the west they want to change like where they do residency most often they don't want to do fellowship because they want to see a different point of view different way of doing things exposure to that and once they have the complete exposure then they decide which way they want to pursue in their life later on so you will become more complete when you have exposure to different institutions and different individuals within the same specialty uh, that will be that you will become more mature and more prepared so i would say if i had a choice if you are a member of my family i would say go and do fellowship somewhere else okay. I, uh, all my friends children i don't work with your parents get out okay uh, uh, from pgi chandigarh kiran would you uh, yes ma'am uh, thank you sir uh, for enlightening us on so many aspect of ophthalmology itself uh, sir i would like to ask two question one continuation of manik's question uh, like you suggested that uh, we should uh, go for fellowships where uh, we get a lot of hand on uh, experience also sir but uh, what if we want come back to government institutes for uh, practicing the whole life then after fellowship uh, how we can apply back uh, to government institute for consultancy and uh, i have one more question i'll ask after uh, you answer this one thank you sir yeah i i really can't answer that because i, I don't I, I, yeah i can i think answer the problem yeah, what the government, government doesn't take uh, consider fellowship as equivalent to senior residency yeah. but that's so, a disadvantage if that is still the same thing i don't know if it has changed now no it is pretty much the same uh, i think they don't uh, uh, take fellowship experience as a teaching experience senior residency they take as a teaching experience a uh, 3 years senior residency post md or ms but i think then it is uh, you will have to do something else to you know uh, get into a teaching institution what people do generally is that they'll do a fellowship and if they think that they don't want to go into you know practice and still do a government job or don't want to join a private organization then they come and do uh, research jobs at the uh, government hospitals because even that Uh, research as a research officer that also has been counted as uh, equivalent to you know teaching oblique research they have put a slash to it so that is recognized dr maypal sir you want to say something 
No, all that uh, I'll wish to say is that actually you need to plan the future. That is most important. Planning maybe a five-year horizon at the minimum is something very important. And in case you want to be in a government job, as uh, Dr. Uh, Jian Rao said, uh, Indians do not change. It's the same rules that happen. So doing a senior residency in a not too great uh, government institution will be counted as experience for applying for an assistant professor's job. But a fellowship in the best of the institutions would not be. So that's uh, really something that you have to see if you want to be into uh, clinical practice, maybe become an entrepreneur, start your own work or uh, join a group, etc. So there you have to hone your clinical skills and to see the other side of how patients are managed, as Dr. G. N. Rao said. And just to there was a question that was asked about international exposure. I think it was the international exposure that I got for a year that made me decide and quit All India Institute of Medical Sciences. And that is because uh, the Indian crab mentality is still so strong and the, uh, and the lack of confidence of taking risks is also uh, one of the major things that people don't wish to take uh, this thing. Uh, all my contemporary is today the chief of RP center, me being two years younger, uh, one could have reached that particular area. But then there is only that little that you can do in a, in an organized setup, which is so strangled hold, uh, has a strangled hold of politicians and bureaucrats, even for your promotions. So that is something which uh, an international exposure at times just opens your eyes at to the possibilities that are there. So the possibilities are immense. The possibilities have to be planned in future as to what you want to do, where your heart lies. And then you have to give 110% after planning. And you need to be very, very clear that in case you want to make an organization or an institution, there was a question by, I think, uh, uh, Divya that team building is something very, very important. And I think one of the biggest problems in India is the ego and the suffix and the prefix of your name to an organization. I think that is a self-limiting step. That means that, that means that you are confined to me, me, or mera ego. So if you put ABC, if my name is Maipal Sajdev, if, if today I would have said uh, Maipal Eye Center, I think there'll be many less people wanting to join a center for sight uh, than if I had my prefix name. So that in itself, you if search has to, your thought process has to be big right from the beginning and your planning has to be big as to what you want. Building a team, as uh, Divya said, is very, very essential. None of us uh, is taught management. None of us is taught uh, team building. That is very, very important. That's what Dr. G. N. Rao embodies, that he would look at talent Talent searching is the first important thing that you have to have that this guy is a team player. Even if a person may not be 110% good, he may be at 95%, but he has to be a team player. So you have to build teams and the teams will be only built if the ego of an individual is not paramount. You have to kill your ego. You have to suppress your ego and you have to give to others that they will do a better job than you are doing. That is the fundamental importance of team that you can build a structure. There are several people who have built structures. They had money, but they don't know how to run it. That is where they are failing is management skills. As was said, nobody teaches management skills. Nobody teaches finance. There are no free lunches in life. You have to make your ends meet wherever you make your money and kill your ego. Uh, you should not, I, that is one thing that I personally feel that it is the ego crisis that happens of doctors and doctors have super egos. That's the biggest, biggest problem that you have to actually suppress your ego and give others a chance to work and give them the freedom, give them the flexibility and provide all the things that are required for them to grow. And once you have a team, the question that came about academic, uh, uh, academic milieu being created, that automatically gets created. But you have to, again, be focused that I want to give back to the ophthalmic community by giving them better trained, better skilled and better uh, academic uh, people uh, to the, uh, to the back to the society. So that's all that I will say is that you need to plan. You need to be very sure if you want to be in a government service or you don't want to. If you don't want to, then you need to know management. You, you should attend classes. You should see as to what it is. Look at how others go even for 15, 20 days. Like Dr. Nagarao said, you go to various places. Even a 15, 20 days or a one-month exposure 
to a particular institution a different institution will open your eyes as to how things are being done at times time management i still remember i went to dr daljit singh's clinic the first time i went was uh, maybe about 15 20 years only and i have been there only once he said uh, i will have you picked up at 4 am in the morning i said what sir he said yes my surgery is i have to finish my surgeries at x time 10 am or whatever and depending on the list uh, he starts earlier and bang at quarter to 4 i was still asleep uh, i got a bell i said he must be joking i got a bell that come on so we went and the way it was and it was pouring that day it was actually monsoons and pouring but the guy was there his son was there ravi jit was there at quarter to 4 to pick me up and it was a trail track kind of a thing like fedrov institute had he had one step being done then there were 12 tables in a line and they were doing cut 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 and that is that is time management that that is something you and one experience of that actually a, a two hour visit changed things in my mind that time management is the most important thing that it the person who wins is the person who squeezes 48 hours out of his 24 hours that is the most important thing that is uh, that is there so i think uh, management uh, is something very very important as regards time and planning in the future whether you want a government job you don't want a government job is something that you have to decide before and and then you do a senior residency or a fellowship uh, that is uh, required fellowship will expose you i think to better techniques better technologies better uh this thing otherwise uh, uh, senior residency uh, is also very very good but solid foundation is something very important as dr nagrao said i owe everything that we have to all india institute of medical sciences and rp center and that is a solid foundation that gives you confidence apart from being a patient for the patient as also being tender to the tender loving care they say the second thing which is very important is your demeanor and your confidence in how you talk to your patient that means that you should be very confident and clear well this is the problem i can handle it i will set it right for you it's your demeanor and your confidence level that makes a lot of difference you cannot be iffy and butty and uh, like a uh, keep on discussing ye bhi ho sakta hai ye bhi ho sakta hai ye bhi fine patient needs to know about things but then ultimately the patient says ke karna kya hai doctor saab aap bata dijiye so until of course you have solid rock solid foundations you will not be confident over confidence is very bad but confidence is something that you need to learn and that happens at the time of your residency and your uh, senior residency or fellowship that's all that uh, i'll wish to say on uh, some of my thoughts on uh, uh, ingredients to success i i would just like to slightly differ with you sir on the government jobs because that is a question and that people might you know want to pursue and that is mm-hmm. that of course politics and bureaucracy you said can be stifling but i think it is all about your attitude and if you are in a government organization be it rp center be it guru nanak ai center be it any other organization of course there are uh, some of the places where there would be limitations uh, to what you want to do and what you can achieve but most of the places i feel it is your own attitude and if you really want uh, you know like uh, like dr g n rao also said that if you really want something that badly then you do get it if you work for it so uh, uh, it is uh, it is and if you do want to get very badly into a government institute in which you you really desire to be you do get it and i think rajesh uh, is also sitting here and i am also here we struggled for almost i mean we did our full officer ship we even stayed beyond that because we didn't want to leave you know rp center or go into a government job so Uh, I think it is all about your attitude. I fully agree, but all that I said was that you need to plan the future. So, like you planned your future that I want to be an RP center. That's your goal. So you plan it five years in advance or six years. So if if you want to be an RP center or you want to be in PI, uh, the Dr. Manik, uh, you uh, or whoever asked the question, then you need oh, to. Kiran, Kiran asked the question. You need to do a senior residency there rather than fellowship. Yes, Dr. Ra- Dr. Rao. So Kiran, actually, you should look at the diff- completely different way. What do you want to become in future? Why are you thinking government, non-government? Sir, uh, you, want to be, you want to be an academic ophthalmologist, clinical practitioner. You want to have a combination of teaching, research, and uh, is that why you think government? I think we should go beyond the old thinking government non government private ngo this that and all what is it that you want and where can i do it the best 
doesn't matter what institution it is who is the who is it affiliated with whether it's government or non governmental it doesn't matter suppose you want to excel in doing something and that opportunity is offered by institutes xyz you just choose one of them it doesn't matter whether they are government or non government so that's the way you should approach in future i think your generation should go beyond that old thinking and actually the country has to change talent merit wherever it is has to be encouraged and we have disadvantage government uh, people have disadvantages non governmental people have disadvantages both have advantages each has their own advantages and disadvantages but don't look at it that way government i want to work for government what reason you want to work for government you have to decide is it security of job you are working on or are you looking at something special you can do there if it is something special you can do there then see where is that you can do best so yes, sir that answers yes, the question kiran you want to say something and then we uh, yes ma'am uh, so uh, uh, this uh, i uh, i got my answer one more thing i wanted to ask uh, like uh, i i think about government setup mostly because if what if one uh, wants to pursue a branch which is which is not in uh, i think I, I, what i should say is not mainstream branch like if you are serving in community if you want to serve in community then uh, cataract and cornea those are the mainstream branch but what if one wants to pursue neuro ophthal or pediatric ophthal that kind of branches which uh, in which one cannot individually work on them, themselves so in mm. that kind of thing if uh, uh, government setups i thought that that can be a better option for such uh, uh, not mainstream but Uh, branches in which one is interested the branches you just said you have more opportunities in india in non governmental setups than government yeah. in governmental you are only in rp center in pgi <laughs> be maybe gurunanak none of the other government institutions have those sub specialties you have those sub specialties far more in the non governmental sector <laughs> So I think uh, towards the end of it, Sohini is there. She had put up a question, and then I'll ask LVPI team to ask questions because they stay with you, uh, you know, uh, day in and day out. So I thought we'll put them right in the end. So Sohini, you want to ask something? And we have Asif. Asif has just passed out from RP Center and is looking for a job. And Sohini, who's in the middle of her residency, midway between. So you have a question, Sohini. Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, thank you, and good afternoon to one and all. Uh, sir, my question for today uh, was uh, uh, because uh, uh, because of the uh, repeated number of lockdowns that is happening throughout the various states of the country, and uh, uh, right now being in a government institution, uh, central government institution, all the OPDs and uh, the clinical practices have been hampered to a much greater extent. so uh, i would like to ask you what is your take on uh, uh, pursuing a, a research fellowship for a six month period uh, during the time being uh, until the lockdown again reopens or is there a possibility of even a research fellowship the research laboratories most of them are closed and uh, the the problem no i think you can do research what you could do is you you get yourself link to one of your faculty members and you could work on their research project and begin to produce manuscripts put your nose to the grind and start writing that you can do from home thank you sir for you know advising her uh, this because it helps us <laughs> you know because last year that's what fortunately our institute people did yeah we ended up with 565 publications so asif yeah i think sir that's a very uh, this thing a uh, very uh, uh, good advice yeah also participate in teaching you can probably train mid level ophthalmic personnel to training programs or you can learn through participating in webinars and online 
educational programs offered by multiple institutions. I see every day I open the email, there are 100 different options that are available to you. You have now uh, a problem plenty, not poverty, to choose from. Asif. So you are from RP Center, second year PG? Or are you a second year? So second year, so I am in second year senior residency uh, from RP Center. Is it true? I hear that nowadays you guys have it, have it easy in RP Center, not like us. <laughs> so they know. have it very easy. We have it more difficult now. Like I said, we are scared of them. <laughs> Martha, Rajesh, all these people seem to be very soft. <laughs> Is that right? You're not answering. He can't yeah. answer it. Oh, that's true, sir. Say, change. say that's right. <laughs> yes, yes. Oh, say that's right. That is absolutely right, sir. <laughs> you know, knowing my father who was who tells me about his days at RP Center and then the things I hear from Professor Mahipal and ma'am and Rajesh sir and the things that you told us about and the things that Professor Ramanjit tells us about the way L.P. Agarwal used to be a disciplinarian. We have it much easier. I I know that. I don't know if it is good or bad. <laughs> so Asif, yes. So Asif has passed his senior residency also. So he wants to know how to go about next. Asif, your question, please. Uh, yes, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am, for the opportunity. Sir, thank you. That was a wonderful speech. Uh, I just completed my senior residency from RP Center and I am um, actually interested in doing some research work. So, in what area did you finish? Uh, I finished in cornea, cornea, ocular surface and refractive cataracts. So mm -hmm. basically I want to uh, plan for a research but I have like uh, not done a proper research anywhere. So I would like to uh, do some kind of a proper research, full time research for some time so that I'll know if I'm actually interested in that. So uh, when I when I chose, I wanted to do in ocular surface. And uh, when I find when I searched for that opportunities, there are very less opportunities for that branch in India. So would you advise like, should I go outside whether the research outside India would be much better than the research that we do here in India or uh, how to go about that? Sir? I think in India now, probably we have about half a dozen places where you could probably pursue that research to the best of my knowledge, maybe there are more at least half a dozen that uh, that can provide you an opportunity like that. But, but the thing is you prepare a list of people and places that can provide you that opportunity and communicate with them. Okay, sir. And wherever you think it matches your requirement, you take it. Sir, what would you say like uh, the research in India and research outside, how is it different? And even in these six or five, six places that I know, it's as good as what happens in the West. Unless you go really get into the very, very uh, top of the line, like uh, not in high institutes, like you go to Harvard and you go into a basic research program at Harvard, Harvard Medical School, mm -hmm. not Harvard Ophthalmology, or you get into NIH, in the US. So the completely different ball game. Okay. Going into another eye center, another eye institute, anywhere else, I don't think there's too much difference. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. So now we come to the last uh, group of people from your own institute, uh, LVPI. So Dimple and Maria, would you want to ask something? You should ask something. <laughs> they trouble us in, right? <laughs> Are you as intimidating uh, to them as Dr. L.P. Agarwal was to you, Dr. Well, Rao? They hardly <laughs> see me. Good afternoon, Dr. Rao. <laughs> yeah, so one question, there's a common conversation that I have with my colleagues. Uh, after residency, they asked me that what is, uh, why should they do super speciality or fellowship if they plan to go into private practice? So what is your advice about that? I told you, 
No need if you think you are qualified as a good comprehensive, you have all the skills to go into practice on your own. No need for a fellowship. Unless you want to go into a subspecialty area, then you need additional. Uh, I would I use the word education. I don't use the word training. Training is just hands. Education is more comprehensive. All aspects. Dimple, uh, would you want to ask something? Uh, yes, ma'am. I also wanted to ask. Uh, good afternoon uh, to everyone present here. And uh, Dr. Rao, my question would be, uh, once you, uh, like you also started a private setup, but then uh, our organization has altogether a different policy for paying and non-paying patients, which I, I just love the uh, uh, concept about paying and non-paying. But uh, once uh, I am planning to enter the private practice, so how can I help the people and uh, how should I go about it? Like how feasible it is to uh, start with paying and non-paying and what is your take on this? How can we help the society? Okay, there are two ways of doing it, I would think. One is any one of us can provide care to anybody we want, right? So even if we are in pure private practice, if you have a policy, I will not deny care to anybody that comes to me. You can provide that care, whether they pay or don't pay. And you may limit it to 10%, 20%. Or every day, I'll see, if I'm seeing 50 outpatients a day, I'll see five free. I'll do one surgery free, whatever, whatever number. Each one can choose their own, own thing. The other is, of course, going for the uh, starting a not-for-profit uh, organization where you clearly define paying and non-paying, two sections, and the non-paying we at LVP is for all our operating expenses, the complete cross subsidization from the money we generate from paying patients. So that covers our operating expenses all the time, since day one, actually. Not day one, I would say for, from the fourth month of inception when we started doing surgeries, we have become self-sustaining for operating expenses. No dependence on soft money, that is grants and donations. And that's a model you can adopt if you wish. You could have the two groups paying, non-paying, and you can determine what percentage. Like our policy is anybody coming to any campus of LVP whether it's vision center, primary care, or Hyderabad, for any problem, however complex it is, or whatever the cost of care shall be given, whether they pay or don't pay. We've been fortunate, we've been able to implement it for 34 years now, but it is difficult. You have to have very, very rigorous systems to make it happen and work. And uh, then you can certainly use your own judgment about whether you want to do 5%, 10%, 20%, 30%, 40%, 40%, whatever. It's a choice that each organization has to make. There's no fixed rule from anywhere. So uh, just one sec, Dimple, I'll just uh, wish to give you an example of the hospitality and the service industry. Uh, we were, uh, I, not at your time, but when we were young, there was only Air India or Indian Airlines that was there. And they were the fares were always fixed, right? And then came in uh, the, uh, the Deccan Air, I think that was the first that came, who started to sell tickets at one rupee. Uh, and uh, then obviously everybody, whether you look at it uh, from a perspective of uh, whatever Indigo you have, you have uh, Vistara, anything, Jet Airways, there are the tires at which they sell. And similarly, if you look at the hotel industry, there are uh, the pre-bookings uh, which you can get at maybe, or there could be various schemes where you can get the same room at less than 50% of the price. The idea is that there is a cost that has already devolved on the organization or the institution that you have built or the practice that you have. The idea is to do capacity utilization so that you can have the volumes to make your numbers, to make you more efficient and to make you self-sustaining as it is. So even at the bottom of the pyramid, if today you look at the uh, balance sheets of various organizations, the best balance sheet is with Arvind Eye Care. 
uh, as compared to anybody else and that is not because they are not doing the uh, uh, they are doing the charity work also they are doing uh, the low cost work as it is but if you see their uh, uh, their annual reports the number of patients that are gravitating from the lower end to the upper end are much more so so the see the word of mouth also helps the capacity utilization also helps the efficiency helps and what arvind has been do, uh, done very well is the backward integration of making their own intraocular lenses their own viscoelastics their everything so basically it becomes a volume this thing and i think uh, all of you i'll just suggest one book for you to read and that is called fortune at the bottom of the pyramid and that is uh, by ck prahlad who was a professor at harvard uh, so doing the free work does not in any case do not take it that if you do work at subsidized rates or charity will drain your uh, your economics so be very clear that clear that if you want capacity utilization then at the first go you need to do work at subsidized rates and you can learn from the airline industry you can learn from the hotel industry and why not learn from arvind and uh, maybe lvp so that's all that i'm saying so it's not going to be uh, difficult for you uh, dr dimple for are uh, doing work at uh, subsidized rates or at uh, charity work uh, because the, the least uh, that uh, you know the cost of uh, goods is um, maybe about 20 30 40% that's about it so you you are not losing 100% but you're losing only on the cost of goods that's about it but i think i have a question based on what as we, dimple as we look into the future you are going into a better situation with the government's uh, schemes like aishman bharat and various state government schemes probably 5 years from now 10 years from now 90 to 95% of all indians will have some kind of an insurance coverage that provides some reimbursement for every procedure so your need to provide complete free care may be minimized so it should not be difficult Right, so one of the questions that Dr. Dimple has asked, and something we were discussing, is also something that is fairly fundamental to a lot of the young ophthalmologists. You know, when we are setting up practice, there are a lot of other skills beyond ophthalmology, beyond basic academics, beyond our understanding of the clinical science that we need. Whether it is this, you know, the concept of let's say entrepreneurship, business, finance, accounting. So, do you think this is something that we all should have? If we should formalize uh, in the sense that, or or is it something that we learn on the go? And I'd also particularly like to know from Dr. Mahipal sir. I mean, how did you learn all these skills? Because I'm sure that's very very important for the organization that you've generated, and as important, sir, to Dr. Rao for the organization that you've made. But both are very different in their outlook. Dr. Rao. Rao first. To <laughs> me, management is application of common sense. I never had an hour of training in management before I started in. Nor was I an avid reader of management books until that time. A lot of thing was sitting, focusing, thinking, and what is right, what is not right, and it will give you all the answers. It's not anything uh, very, very difficult. It's a question of focusing and trying to make the decision. that are objective that are fair and then you have it and then there are things like finance and all you learn on the go and then i i set up simple systems for finance from day one we separated completely what we generate from our work the paying patients from the money that we get from donations and grants complete separation similarly i wanted to know how much we are earning each day and how much we are spending each day those figures of constant tracking so those kinds of simple steps just two examples i'm giving there of course there are other analysis financial things and all that but i think as long as you apply simple principles and then you get to learn the more complex ones as you go along it's not as they call rocket science i wouldn't use the word rocket science i would say it's not medical science i think medical science is more complicated than rocket science more uncertainties so uh, can i uh, digvijay the uh, uh, what uh, dr dn rao said i would fully agree with it uh, if i look back the only thing that aided me apart from common sense was also reading economic times for the last 30 years 
early in the morning and now mint okay so it it kind of changes your horizon as to the thought process our thought process when we are doing medical science is very very limited uh, we are uh, kind of grilled only how to do clinical work how to do clinical diagnosis how to see findings in uh, retina cornea etc do things but the overall management of a particular thing is not and uh, management is a lot of common sense but then this common sense needs to be organized it needs to be honed and it needs to be channelized the channelization for that i would slightly have a little disagreement uh, uh, here is that books are the distillate of somebody's somebody's entire life if today dr g n rao would write a book i would love to read it if arvind system has been written about i would love to read it because that will give me the distillate of what that organization or what that individual did there are there are books the which have made the immense uh, uh, impression on my mind uh, one i told you was fortune at the bottom of the pyramid the other book is jack welch the world is flat so so basically there are books which allow you to get the nichod or the some substance of as to how people were successful and the other thing that is there is which starts from the day one which i said was planning when i was stepping out of all india institute of medical sciences it was by choice it wasn't that i didn't have a job or anything i it was by choice and when i was to i was uh, 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 trying to tie up with somebody the first thing that he told me was write your business plan for 5 years as to what and where do you think you want to be and this i have said uh, uh, before also and what was important is like you write a scientific paper the most difficult part for you to write is the abstract so he said do not write it in more than one one page because writing reams and essays about big dream this that and the other is something you you write a distillate and write one page as to what it is and make a business plan as to where it is where we want to go and what you want to do and then track the numbers what even dr gn rao uh, despite running uh, such as huge organization or uh, even in the ngo space uh, would uh, would be knowing and he told himself that after the lockdown the primary centers and the secondary centers did 1 for 150% of what 150% of budget and then he said these uh, uh, the uh, the tertiary centers did 80% or whatever it is so there there is a tracking at every place that has to be there so even if you are running a single practice you have to get out of the fact ke jo hoga hoga is something different you have to set targets you need to set goals and you need to find ways and means to reach up to that particular thing we don't even see that after every year there's a cost of inflation are we increasing our consultation fees or our surgical charges by 5% or 7% or something like that so there has to be some science that has to go there has to be some number tracking that has to be uh, going there has to be a foresight there has to be a big plan the five year plan that is there we are not taught that and for that i uh, it is it is not out of the way to uh, every one of us has common sense but channelizing the common sense like dr lp agarwal channelized dr g n rao or our teachers dr madan mohan etc channelized us in the in the skill sets there has to be something that has to actually make you focused and channelized and be passionate about it things which we consider chalta hai matlab ho jayega ho jayega that does not that does not work you have to have goals you have to set uh, your priorities and you need to see tomorrow if i have to raise finances for that i'm not going to any charity organization or bill gates or melinda gates to give me funds how do i get the funds whether i want to do a debt uh, restructuring i want debt or i want private equity or i want to give uh, esops to my uh, my uh, my doctors etc so all that is very very important read some books uh, uh, maybe not basics of management but read the life stories and the histories and the the pearls of wisdom uh, to uh, to what people are saying i have sat through the entire thing because i know that i will get something out of what dr g n rao says mm -hmm. there is there are pearls of wisdom that i'll get even at this age and that can modify and it's never too late to modify yourself or to implement even small changes the japanese word kaiza 
is something which is very, very important that small incremental steps lead you to the level of perfection. And it's a continuous process. We are on a treadmill just to be where we are because what I still remember uh, when I was in practice, uh, there was somebody uh, who had a third generation practice in Delhi and said that uh, it, everything is fine. Sab kuch aata hai, whatever aata. I just told him with uh, due respect, sir, when you sleep at night, there are others who are working hard. And that that is something very, very important. Hard work, being passionate, working 14 hours a day, 365 days a year. And uh, I, I know even Dr. G.N. Rao, he is the first to come and last to go, uh, be the first to come and last to go. And you need to have that willpower to define your goals and to take risks to go on to that goals that is there. And then you have to set up a team. Today, we have a huge team of uh, finance, uh, management, uh, whether you do a business development, whether you call it uh, branding, everything, you, you need to have the works. So that is, uh, that is the uh, end solution. We still are thinking very small in ophthalmology, very, very small in ophthalmology. You don't have great entrepreneurs in ophthalmology. Uh, you have people who have built social organizations, have built, but from a perspective the, the youngsters, I think you guys need to look at ways and means by which you can bring ophthalmology to the doorstep of everybody, whether it's tele-ophthalmology, whether it is, and there's so much of money that's coming in for artificial intelligence, for making things much more easy. Robotics are going to come in. Gene therapy is going to come in. Things are going to be much different 20 years down the line. So think big. I think uh, that is something uh, which I would wish to say that uh, apna horizon needs to be changed and for changing the horizon, I think you need to look at how others change the horizon. I think uh, we've had uh, such a massive discussion and, and, and there is a massive uh, uh, number of people who are, you know, watching us again on the YouTube, on the Facebook, on the Zoom. We've never had such numbers before, right from the start of uh, Dr. Rao's uh, lecture. So uh, if there are no more questions, uh, Dr. Uh, Krishna from Center for Sight or Yusra sir, if they want to ask, we can uh, we can then you know have one last word from uh, Dr. Rao and also Dr. Rajesh would want to say something. Rajesh is listening. Yeah, yeah definitely. I would love to say something because I've been listening to Dr. Rao and also Dr. Mahipal and both have been immensely successful in their way in their um, in their own way. Uh, what I felt that, uh, you know, the crux of everything is uh, dependent on three keywords. One is proper planning. The second is uh, uh, self-discipline. And uh, the third is time management. I mean, these are the th three things with uh, even Dr. Mipal uh, gave an example of Dr. Daljeet Singh uh, and, and Dr. Rao was telling throughout his uh, lecture and also the question answer. So these three things we have to keep working on. Actually, what I feel is that the, uh, you know, little bit of discipline I do have, a little bit of uh, planning, <laughs> but the time management, I'm still lacking, uh, you know, I'm lagging behind. I have to still, you know, work on that. Similarly, all of us and all of you with residents, you all have to manage your time in the best possible manner. And uh, I mean, it was a wonderful lecture, a lot of things to learn and a lot of, uh, uh, you know, take home messages. Only thing, only thing I would also like to have a copy of the one page uh, business plan that Dr. Maipal had written that because, <laughs> because that will be crux of, uh, you know, 30 years of economic times. <laughs> that is something... Yes, uh, jokes apart, but then definitely there was a lot of learning for all of us. And uh, thanks a lot for 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 enlightening us uh, with so many words of wisdom. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Rao. Thank you, Dr. Mipal. Thank you, Dr. Rao, for your time, for your contributions, uh, and especially for spending time and answering all these residents. I think uh, these residents and fellows are going to be really elated. And when they were told they are going to be a part of the program, you know, I think uh, their days were made. I uh, answering one to one like this, having such an opportunity, I think is uh, you know something which everybody looks forward to. As far as we are concerned, or I am concerned, Rajesh put it you know very rightly. So many anecdotes and so many examples you gave, 
which you know we can follow and uh, we should incorporate in our own lives even at this stage uh, and and even at this age so uh, what to talk of the residents and the students and uh, we cannot experience uh, what you have experienced but when you tell us your experiences we become so much enriched by it and your way of putting is so uh, so convincing that you know uh, we just take it like a gospel truth so thank you so much for your time and for your contributions and for an excellent uh, uh, lecture i would like to thank all the uh, people who were watching it on youtube on facebook there were so many requests for the links which we had to uh, give and uh, we would also like to thank our uh, sponsors for this sun pharma who has helped us uh, audio visual team at the back and uh, of course mr kripal rana who is at the aios headquarter uh, who's uh, helped to organize this so thank you dr rao yeah, yeah. Three, like three, one more sentence sir three that, words you know, i have yes. I had the opportunity to meet uh, dr rao so many times and every time i got some message or the other but it was a great opportunity to have uh, you know a detailed discussion with you for you know um, uh, for such a long time I, i mean you hardly get so much of time to sit with people and discuss so many things so it was a great opportunity and uh, thanks for the for all the messages that you gave so i would also wish to thank uh, dr rao it's always a pleasure sir to listen to you and i will put you as uh, a living legend for ophthalmology uh, great learnings always from people who create things from scratch and uh, always uh, been impressed by your story and uh, the institution that you have created uh, one of the finest institution that's going to survive for centuries to come and uh, always a pleasure and thank you very much for uh, uh, being uh, with the youngsters who are uh, who have lot of uh, questions and at an impressionable age and uh, who have lots of uh, things to do and i think uh, indian ophthalmology will really fly high uh, with uh, legends like you there and uh, with the youngsters like the people who attended uh, being bringing up the future thank you once one sentence namrata dedication diligence and discipline three d these encompasses all the things that are required three d's and three h also so i think we will we will uh, you know you all can do it go for it and conquer the world yes and don't don't forget the most disadvantaged women living in the remotest area of our country not having access to basic health care and basic necessities as an educated indian let's never forget that that's our responsibility we are all very privileged all of us are in the top 1% of india 99% don't have our privileges thank you thank you thank you dr rao and thank you dr maypal sir thank you